Neighbors of the train derailment demand answers. Welcome to Columbus on the Record. It has been two weeks since a train derailed in East Palestine, Ohio, caught fire and spilled cancer causing chemicals. And residents are not cooling down. The Norfolk Southern train derailed along the Ohio-Pennsylvania border, sending flames and smoke high into the air. To prevent one of the rail cars from exploding, state officials agreed to what was called a controlled leak and burn. While environmental officials say the air and water are safe, skeptical residents are not so sure. They packed a meeting this week and demanded answers. Government officials promise accountability. I think most of the residents here are concerned that they're going to sweep this under the rug. You know, we've got dead fish in the streams. We, there's a lot of reports of pets and animals dying. And, you know, we just want to make sure that we're taken care of here. We are absolutely going to hold Norfolk Southern accountable. And I can promise you that. Joingle's tiny village, I think fewer than 6,000 people, but they're making a lot of noise and they're not going quietly. They are not going quietly. They have a lot of concerns about this. And we have seen in the news um, in the past 20 years situations where initially uh, people are told, hey, there's no, no problem, nothing to see here. And then years later, you find out, yeah, there was a problem and the water was a problem or the air was a problem. That's what these folks are talking about. They're saying, you know, there's something going on. We don't feel safe here. And um, it's compounded by the fact that they feel like they're not getting the answers that they want. And uh, at that meeting that you just showed, uh, Norfolk Southern was supposed to be there, and uh, they pulled they pulled the representatives out of that meeting beforehand. Um, and Governor DeWine uh, was saying, you know, he thinks that's a mistake. He thinks that the representatives of Norfolk Southern need to talk to the people who live in East Palestine. Yeah, ironically, Palestine. they blamed a concern for public safety for yeah. not going to there. And of course, the residents there don't feel safe. Terry, the controlled release and burn. The argument was it prevented an explosion, which could have been really bad, but was that the right thing to do in hindsight, do you think? Well, the governor, I thought, did a very good job in several of his news conferences this week, and he detailed it wasn't just like the governor flipped a coin and said, let's do this or do that. They worked with the Pentagon, in fact, to do modeling, to test the pro and con, because neither was a perfect and ideal choice, but they felt this was better and safer. Uh, and obviously, we've got a long ways to go. And to the governor's credit, he's raised and brought out a problem that I found out from some experts in the area that the feds in the 1970s basically took over regulation of the rails. The question long term is do we need some changes in federal law so there's more teeth to make sure the railroads are operating safely and properly? Brian, is that it's going to be a while to find out who's to blame and what happened here, but. Regulation has been lessened on the railroads. Well, it, it, it is a problem, and, and frankly, you know, the first thing we have to do is make sure those folks are safe, and, and they, they have questions, and the EPA is going by what they can do, so is the state. It's a very difficult situation. But this is what happens when you attack regulation for businesses and you think it's just a good thing. I mean, one, one of the problems in the rail industry to save money, they just pack a lot of freight long trains, it's gotten longer and longer and longer. Anybody who lives near an auto plant or a big manufacturing plant knows that, and they're just trying to save money on it. Um, look, here in Ohio, we have the DeWine administration that wants to throw away one third of the administrative code. Just willy nilly, let's get rid of one third. Well, some of those regulations might seem excessive, but they protect us from situations like this. Joe, CBS reported that the train broke down two days before this accident. A couple of employees have complained that it was too long, it was too heavy, and if a derailment happens, it, they're really bad. Yeah, yeah, and there's, you know, that's not all. I mean, there's been other complaints about different things that have happened on this rail line or other air, rail lines that have um, been carrying hazardous material. The one thing I found kind of interesting is Governor DeWine says that these railroads, when they're carrying hazardous material, they don't need to let the state know about this. And he would like to change that. He wants Congress to step in and say, hey, if, uh, if you're carrying hazardous material in a state, you have to let the state 
know so that they can have their management people, agencies on alert as that train goes through to make sure that immediately there's someone on the ground dealing with the problem. This, this is not the first time this has happened. I mean, some of us who've been around a long time ago remember Miamisburg, and I do think there were certain restrictions that were put in place at that time, but they're not enough. And on top of that, the, the rail industry is just, for cost-cutting measures, they're just putting too much freight, too many dangerous chemicals on one train. Terry, but these accidents still are rare. The number of derailments has gone way down since the 1970s. Is the regulation enough right now? Well, it's always a challenge because we've discovered during the past couple of years that the supply chain is important. And is it less or more risky to do it by rail or to do it by trucks on interstate highways. Neither of those are good choices. Certain of these chemicals can't be done in pipelines, which are ultimately the safer way to do certain types of materials. But clearly this needs to be looked at legislatively and you gotta make sure there's better laws and to make sure that the Federal Rail Administration, a part of ODOT, or excuse me, the national ODOT, is really enforcing and staying on top of things. There's been some finger pointing about should the governor, should the president declare this a state of emergency? It's easy when it's a natural disaster, but these residents are as affected as in any hurricane zone or earthquake, and so the law doesn't allow the, the government to do that apparently for man-made or Disaster. Well, yeah, and, and Governor DeWine said he that, that this does not qualify for the standards for FEMA to come in and help at this time. However, he says that the state is filing some paperwork, and if there's something about this situation that changes in the future to make it so that FEMA could actually help, um, that paperwork work would make it so that they could. But it's, it's a really sticky situation because there are specific guidelines for FEMA, and this apparently doesn't meet them. And, this and is Re Representative Amelia Sykes is on the Transportation Committee, and yesterday wrote letters calling for hearings to figure out what we can change in terms of those standards. But the Congress needs to do its job in writing the laws and thinking about as they write the laws that there's enough teeth in them so that they can solve it. Because too many times Congress does a half job of writing laws, then they allow the administrators to write the rules and sometimes there's a disconnect. Yeah, it's Federal Emergency Management Agency, not Federal Natural Emergency Management Agency, which is what the complaints are here in East Palestine. Anyway, more than a month into the legislative session, the Ohio House has begun legislating. Bickering between House Republicans stalled filing of legislation until this week. But this week, the bills came. House Bill Number 1 would cut and flatten the state income tax and pay for it by cutting state aid to cities and schools. Other bills would fund affordable housing programs, recruit teachers, allow any student in Ohio to get a taxpayer-funded private school voucher, and another would ban the handful of transgender girls who want to play on female school sports teams from doing so. Terry Casey, a lot of bickering between the two factions of the Republican House. This is Jason Stevens, the Speaker's proposal. This seems like a, a legislative agenda that pretty much all Republicans in the House could get behind, no? Well, there's a lot of details in there, including taking away sales tax on baby materials, affordable housing. There's things that both sides can agree on. There's some that only certain elements. But I give a lot of credit to James Madison when he dreamed up America and having two legislative branches and checks and balances. What people propose is kind of like kids on their Christmas list. They got a lot of things. What really happens? But there's a lot of... Uh, virtue in having a House and a Senate, even though they're both Republican, they don't always agree, and it's going to take some time to work through it. So this is a starting point. It's not the final agenda. Joe Derek Merrin, the person who wanted to be Speaker, was thwarted at the last minute, has his own Republican caucus, he says. These are bills that he supports, the transgender sports ban, the backpack bill, which allows people to get vouchers even if they're not in an underperforming school. What does he think of all this? Well, uh, to an extent, he likes them, but you know, there's going to be some disagreement between Marin and Stevens because they they both have different camps, if you will. I mean, it, Stevens was elected with the help of Democrats as House Speaker. So that kind of tempers uh, the way he's going to approach some of this versus Marin, who's supported by the Republicans who are in the caucus. So, you know, they're looking at these two things, these, these bills, and they're looking at them two different ways. 
And uh, we haven't seen enough yet as far as debate to see where it stands, but the devil is always in the details on this stuff. Brian, Democrats, are they happy that the backpack bill is in there, the private school voucher Absolutely bill? Absolutely not. The transgender ban is in it? Now, as Terry points out, this is just a proposal, but not going anywhere. This is a proposal, and, and it looks like there are, are things that the, both the governor and Speaker Stevens put in there so that he can go either way if he has to get a majority, and it's gonna, we'll see how that sort of washes out. But, but you know, this attack on public schools continues. They're trying to, through cutting the income tax, which be benefits, by the way, only the wealthiest in Ohio when you go to this flat tax. Uh, poorer Ohioans or middle class Ohioans are going to pay actually more when it comes to this. It's going to take money away from schools, local government, which means there's going to be pressure to raise taxes at the local level. I don't understand state-sponsored bullying of the four students who are transgender in high schools. It is a talking sports, point. Yeah. Is, it is a polling point. It is a talking point. It is irresponsible, and it is it is literally state-sponsored bullying, and it's gotten out of control in the legislature. This is not something that belongs at that level. Shouldn't they leave? We've asked this question before in this show, but shouldn't they leave the regulation of that to the schools and the and the school athletic associations for the well, transgender girls? Th there's definitely some question on this issue and a whole bunch of other issues of how much should the state that's picking up a large percentage of the money for K through 12 education. How much should the state set standards and policies on educational things and other kind of issues versus how much is local control? So that's been an ongoing battle. How much is local? How much is done at the state level? And there's also proposals there to get the Board of Education more focused on workforce development because there's a legitimate feeling there's a disconnect in Ohio between K through 12 community colleges, higher ed, how do you make them all better mesh to build the workforce of the future. But one thing that people misunderstand, because there's a lot of talk about this backpack bill and giving money for charter schools and, and vouchers. You know, it is cheaper, but, but those schools are not, they don't have to take kids that are in a disadvantaged situation. They don't have to, to deal with folks that are disabled in some way. Public schools take care of all of that, and so there is extra cost, and they have to continue to do it. So you're not saving money by cutting public schools. You're just going to put pressure on people to raise money at a local level. The 60% uh, threshold proposal to get a constitution pass, constitutional amendment passed by the voters, that is still out there. The resolution has been filed. But Stevens didn't mention it much, but Derek Merrin wants that. So. Yes. Um, and, you know, we... Um, one of the reasons they want this is they want to try to um, beat back some of the th the potential uh, changes that could come, like redistricting and abortion and you know other other kind of things that uh, maybe they don't want to deal with and don't want in the state constitution. That still remains out there, but the Democrats have been very out front on this that they don't like this 60% threshold. And uh, there's also been some question as to whether if you put this to the electorate, would the electorate even pass it? So it's going to be put quieter. And there's a big question among conservative Republicans. Not all of them are in agreement on the 60%. Some have some strong feelings against. And people like Mike Curtin, former state representative, dispatch editor, he says there's a potential compromise of doing a 55% level, but then making some other changes in how bills get to the thing. So I think there's going to be some good attention in the House committee, constitutional revision set up for this, to dig in and look at the details. And the state Senate has signaled they're not not so sure they're ready to jump on board that train. Let's just call a spade a spade. This is about the abortion issue. Almost Speaker Marin, uh, and I call him almost Speaker because he thinks he is, uh, it is going nowhere uh, if he can't get the majority in the House and the Senate. The problem here is why, why would we be afraid of the electorate? You know, I mean, y you can't take people's rights away without them reacting negatively, and I don't think it would pass. Their, their argument is that private outside groups are funding these, and that's what they want to stop. But anyway, the abortion rights supporters are moving from planning to acting. Two groups have joined together and soon will draft a proposed constitutional amendment to guarantee a woman's right to an abortion. The goal, they say, is to put it on the fall ballot. Advocates indicate their proposals will be similar to Michigan's recently approved amendment. So here it is. It amended Michigan's constitution to establish a new individual right to reproductive freedom, including the right to make all decisions about pregnancy and abortion 
allow the state to regulate abortion in some cases and forbid prosecution of individuals exercising the established right. It goes on to say it allows the state to regulate abortion after fetal viability, but not prohibit if medically needed to protect a patient's life or physical or mental health. That amendment passed with 56% of the vote in Michigan. Abortion rights opponents promise a tough fight, saying they will, quote, defeat any attempt to place late-term abortions in our Constitution. Joe Engels, it's a long haul to get to the ballot in November. Not a lot of time to do it, and this, but it sounds like they're getting ready to go. There are a lot of different constituencies who are coming together to uh, push this, this referendum out there. Uh, one of the things that we're going to see is they have to go before Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost, who's a stalwart when it comes to abortion. They're also going to have to go before the ballot board, um, and that, that could be a challenge to get the language they want. Then they have to come up with 413,000 thereabout signatures. Uh, valid signatures, it's not an easy climb. It's never an easy climb to get on the ballot. But they have a lot of backing from a lot of different strategists that have worked on these campaigns in other states. And uh, I think, you know, we're going to see a lot of pushback from the other side, too. So they're going to have to be very careful that whatever language they put out there, it's going to have to fit the state. And Joe earlier made the comment, the, d the details make all the difference. On this one, it's especially true, and I'm going to do an early prediction. This could lead up this fall to World War III in Ohio with as much as $100 million spent, and that's when they look at when is abortion allowed or not allowed, and then the details such as how do you define a woman's health, mental health, physical health, what's the standards for that kind of thing. So the details will be important, but Joe did go through. There's a lot of steps to go through. Well, and you know, I, first of all, it's good that they all came together and decided uh, between this year and next year. The, the real issue here is gonna be getting through that hump and dealing with things like the ballot board where I think there'll be a lot of games trying to make the language more difficult when people read it to understand which side you're on and which way your vote goes. But I think that for many Ohioans, and especially women in Ohio, they don't want the state involved in their life. Terry, the, the Michigan Amendment, you, th there's no perfect language. You can poke holes at anything, because there's never black and white when it comes to this stuff on any definition of physical health, life-threatening. But viability is in that amendment. It's the Roe standard, and a majority of Ohioans supported Roe is that that is a key line. Do you expect that in the Ohio proposal? I don't know what they're going to do, and that's what everyone's going to be looking for, because viability since the original Roe decision 50 years ago, medically, the good news is we've advanced medically, and viability can occur at an earlier date than it once was. So there's going to be debate over viability. It's still 22, 20 weeks, 22, 23 weeks. Well, but some would say it's actually shrunk up. Maybe that's true, maybe that's not mm -hmm. true. But again, all these details are going to be important, and that's why they could be if and if and if it's on in the fall, the television wars would be so ugly and the mail so ugly because people arguing over what it means. One thing, though, if you look at the Ohio abortion reports in recent years, that's the data combined the, for the Ohio Department of Health. If you look at those abortions in that, that period of which, uh, um, you know, it could be a viable pregnancy, you're not going to see numbers there. In fact, in some years it's zero, in some years it's a handful. That's not where the abortions... It's because they didn't happen. That's right, the right. they didn't reported. happen. Yeah. And so you get so far along into a pregnancy, and even if the, the pregnancy has problems, um, they will find another way to, you know, either induce or, you know, do something else. But um, after a certain point, I, I mean, there is no evidence at all in the data that women are going in at seven, eight, nine months pregnant saying, oh, I really don't want to be pregnant. I don't want to, you know, have a baby, so I want an abortion now. But, that but just doesn't again, exist. The data isn't meant, it, it doesn't match up with the polling, and what you're seeing uh, is language being crafted in the extreme. And in that respect, I agree with you, Terry. It's going to be a pretty ugly, ugly 
discussion next fall yeah, because this is, of that. This is called politics where people don't always look at the facts because each side is trying to spin it and define it to its view of what it means or what the how the people should look at it. And going back to the ballot board, how the ballot language is written and headlined makes a huge amount of difference when people walk in and actually yeah. vote. Mm -hmm. All right, one of the uh, star witnesses took the stand in the Larry Householder bribery trial this week. Householder and four others were charged with orchestrating a more than $60 million bribery scheme to get him elected speaker, then pass a law to bail out two nuclear power plants and then kill a repeal effort. This week, one of those charged who has pleaded guilty took the stand. Juan Cespedes described a meeting in which a first energy lobbyist slid a $400,000 check across the table to Larry Householder and said, our client cares very much about our issue, presumably the bailout. Cespedes said another $100,000 check was given to Householder at another meeting. Cespedes testified the money went to the PAC Generation Now, which was not allowed to coordinate with Larry Householder. Householder and his co-defendant Matt Borges say they are not guilty of these charges. Brian Rothenberger, this is right out of the movies. Yes, it is. An envelope passed across the table, if the testimony is, it, is it, true. It is what people have always suspected went on. Uh, you also heard a tape recording of the late, uh, you know, of... Neil Clark. Neil Clark and you know Neil was basically at a dinner doing the same thing. We also heard this week that the then president of First Energy or chief executive officer, I can't remember his title, expected to make a hundred million dollars after after we citizens bailed this out. He was going to sell it and make a hundred million dollars, and then Juan was supposed to make two million dollars off of that. Look. We are going to send somebody to jail over this, but it is not going to stop the problem. The problem is twofold. We have too many people of means that can get access at the state house. We have too many people that are uh, letting industry run the PUCO, the watchdogs of the PC, PUCO, and term limits have let lobbyists run the, rule the roost in the legislature. Terry this was, it's a, it really get an idea of how politics was done in this case, according to these folks who are testifying. But is it illegal? That's well, that's question. one of the questions. And I went back before today's program to reread stories from the New York Times, Washington Post on the U.S. Supreme Court ruling nine to zero on the Virginia governor's case that basically said the federal prosecutors, the definition of prid quid pro quo is not quite what you claim it is, it narrowed it down. So that's why coming up in the next week or two when Jeff Longstreth has already pled guilty, when he testifies and goes under cross-examination, that would be must-see TV. Unfortunately, in a federal courtroom, it's not on you, TV, it's not, on TV, right. it's not audio, but his testimony, that's gonna be the day or two or three that's gonna be most important as he's grilled back and forth of what really happened. It's because, Joe, he is, he was the money guy. He was in charge of transferring the money between the accounts and from First Energy to Generation Now and possibly to Larry Householder, according to prosecutors. Right, right. And, you know, it takes all, I, I mean, you almost need a map to follow when you're watching this because money was transferred around in such weird ways to try to get to people. But I think the one thing that, that this is really showing is that the courts really need to be um, showing what's happening inside the courtrooms. I mean, we've got local courts who are showing it, and in the Ohio Supreme Court, you can watch it on TV. Um, you can't do that with a federal court, and people don't believe in the judiciary like they used to. Polling shows that there's a lot of questions about it. So I think, you know, that's one reason we're not hearing about this case much is because people don't know much about it in the public. And number two, they can't watch it and they don't understand it. So they might very well be able to do something like this again. Terry, really quickly, we don't know how this is going to turn out, but it shows the influence of money in politics. Yes, is there anything we can do to lessen that influence? Well, every time they've tried, like going back to 74 after Watergate, they said, we've got a great idea for reform. It's called PACs. <laughs> and that'll solve it. And then people said we got to abolish PACs because they're corrupt. And by the way, it isn't just rich millionaires on both sides. It's labor unions. It's business related people. There's a lot of people. And we do have something in the Constitution, First Amendment, about the right to petition your grievances. Uh, and cons contributions are considered free speech. 
But obviously it's not all pretty and there's clearly rules. And there in the testimony, clearly some people have complained that somebody gave somebody this yeah. money and then they didn't do anything. And uh, yeah. if you don't have $2,400 to pay for a dinner at a private club, apparently you don't have free speech. Anyway, time for our final off the record parting shots. Brian Rothenberg, you're up first. I believe the one thing that is going to fly through in the budget is going to be the housing issue. I think that it's got a lot of people uh, working together on it. It's a huge issue here and around the country, affordable yep. housing, affordable for everybody. Terry. The budget's off to a fast start, and in the Ohio House last week, I talked to Jay Edwards, who's the new chairman, and I think they're going to get it passed and through the House earlier, and that goes to the Senate. We'll see what the Senate wants to do, but the key time is going to be June, because they'll have revised revenue estimates. They'll have better ideas of how much money they really have or don't have to spend. Okay. Sure. I think we're going to see uh, something to confuse this abortion issue. Mainly, I think there could be another group that comes out on the other side with something of its own that will confuse the language, confuse the voters in this abortion issue, and they're going to have plenty of money to do it. So two questions on the ballot, possibly. I, maybe. Who knows? Who knows how they're going to do it? I'm just going to say that there, there's going to be a lot of confusion created. All right. Ohioans have been only betting legally for six weeks on sports, that is. But the state does not appear happy with the system. The governor wants to double the tax on betting companies already. And betting companies have already agreed to pay $750,000 in fines for violating advertising rules. It'll be interesting to compare the size of those penalties to the revenues those companies earned just since the January 1st, and we will get those numbers soon. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Continue the conversation on Facebook, and you can watch us anytime at our website, wosu.org slash COTR, or through the PBS video app. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.